someone broke into my house and jumped into the shower with me. When I was a kid, like nine years old, my sister and I were doing swimming classes together at our community pool. So one evening, after my mom picked us up from the pool and she told us to get ready to go to the grocery store, My family owns a restaurant and we were a comfortable bunch of people to say the least then. But earlier in the day, someone had cut a pipe outside the house. And whilst an employee of ours was fixing the pipe, he left the door open and a man came into our home and hid all day long, literally from like 10 a.m. Now, this is at 6.30 p.m. I went upstairs to shower to get the chlorinated water off of me before we left home and my sister was changing in our room. Someone, the guy, came into the bathroom and started rummaging through the drawers. I asked what my sister was looking for because I couldn't see through the frosted glass at that point. I assumed she was looking for something for her hair. Then the guy literally froze and jumped into the shower with me. He pulled off his shirt and draped it over my head and at this point I was screaming. I crouched down into a ball to protect myself and I screamed for dear life. Some guy from the street heard me screaming, and he bolted through the house before anyone else could have come to help me. And the guy who was in the shower with me got freaked and jumped out from with me and ran out the back door. At this point in time, my dad had already got his gun and was running to see if I was okay. I was too traumatized to go into the bathroom by myself for like a year and a half later. Two men broke into my apartment while I was sleeping inside. Obligatory, I'm on mobile, so I'm sorry for the formatting, but I've been creeping for a while and thought that this story would fit here. This happened two years ago, my sophomore year at university. This was my 22 female very first apartment, and I was so excited to be in it. My freshman year, I had lived in a dorm on campus, and before that I just lived with my mom, so I had never lived on my own before. The apartment was a two-bedroom, two-bath, and I shared it with my friend who I had known since we were 13. I had just turned 20 when all of this happened. Josh. Josh was my absolute best friend, and it was his first year at the university. So naturally I was like, oh my god, I'll show you around. And we did everything together, pretty much. Fast forward to the homecoming football game. We attend a university that's crazy into football, and we're actually a pretty good team. So the homecoming game is a big deal to everyone. Josh was so excited to go out because it was his first homecoming game. He was going to go with this boy he started flirting with and he wanted me to come along. I don't really remember why I didn't want to go, I just didn't. Josh got mad at me, we said dumb stuff to each other and he left. So I was alone for the rest of the night. I had, still do, a small dog, Poppy, who lived with us. She was around a year old at the time. We actually had a pretty relaxing night in the beginning. I took a shower and put a face mask on, and Poppy and I watched TV in bed and stuff. I remember listening to a song on repeat the entire day, because that's what I do when I find a new song that I like. To this day, I still can't listen to it without being reminded. We went to sleep around 10 p.m., I think. I wasn't keeping up with what was going on with the football game, so I really have no idea if it was just ending or whatever. But I knew not to expect Josh home early because he was going out with the guy he was seeing, Dylan, afterwards. There was a strip of bars along one of the main roads running towards campus, and that's where they would be. That's where everyone would be after the game ended. I don't know what time it was, but I woke to the cabinets being slammed and really loud noises. It was really dark in my room, and the only thing I could see was that the kitchen lights were on. I saw the light coming through the bottom of the door. It sounded like people were going through our kitchen cabinets one by one. Poppy was at the edge of the bed barking like a crazy dog. I had never seen her act this way. I was struggling to keep myself awake because I'm a really heavy sleeper. Not anymore. And I just knew it wasn't Josh and Dylan. But some stupid part of me decided to call out, Hello? But it was weak sounding and I really don't know if they heard me or not. Suddenly my bedroom door opened. I shot up. 
Poppy was snarling and trying to lunge at the stranger in my fucking bedroom. I couldn't see anything because the light from the open door was kind of blinding. I just saw his figure. He was wearing a hoodie and he stood there for maybe 15 seconds and I was just staring at him. The whole time Poppy was just trying to fuck him up. He quickly closed the door and I don't know why I just didn't move. I wanted to move. Please move. Then my door flings open a second time and we're staring face to face again for the same painfully long amount of time. My heart was racing and I remember thinking, he is going to hurt me. Now that I look back, I should have screamed or something. Poppy was at the very edge of the bed now, vicious and snarling. She sounded like a big dog, honestly. And then he slammed my door shut. As soon as he did, I jumped out of bed and locked my door. I heard them take my car keys. I was terrified they would find my car and steal it since I had just parked directly outside. I frantically called 911 and was sobbing the whole time. I said, Someone is in my house. They came in my room, please help. And it took them 30 minutes to get there. When I know that there were cop cars everywhere surrounding the bars, since it was homecoming, which I live a five minute drive from. When I finally came out, the living room and my roommate's bedroom were completely ransacked. My roommate's TV was on the floor because they tried to carry it out but I guess they decided to just leave it. They stole my Xboxes and all my games. They stole my fucking book bag with my textbooks and my homework in it. The two policemen got there, and I told them everything and asked if I could call my roommate. Josh picked up the phone but was heavily slurring and I could tell that he was inside of a bar and could barely hear me. I just screamed, please give Dylan the phone, hoping that Dylan was at least more sober than Josh was. So Josh put Dylan on the phone and I don't know how, through my tears and sobs and through the screaming people and music, but he heard me say that our apartment was robbed. He frantically said we are coming and hung up. They probably ran. While I was waiting for them, one of the policemen asked if he could try to take prints from my roommate's TV and I agreed. He proceeds to then drop his flashlight directly on the screen, and as it shattered, he just looked at me. I'm like, really? So then Josh and Dylan get back and the policemen totally change their tone. They get aggressive and say that we were targeted for a reason. I'm pretty sure that since it was homecoming, the robbers were not expecting me to be there. And we're trying to just rob apartments blindly. We also lived on the ground floor, so it's easier to get in those than in the two-story and three-story apartments. Josh is in the military, but Josh looks like any other regular college freshman boy and his only friends at the time were literally me and Dylan, so we were the only ones who knew he was in the military. They tried to accuse Josh of stashing guns and drugs everywhere, and that's why we got robbed. I literally was like, are you fucking kidding me? They then tried to pull me to the side and say that Josh hired people to come rob his own apartment while I was inside. They asked me, how do you know these guys? I said, sir, I have known Josh since we were 13. We moved here together to attend university together. He just gave me a look. When they left, we got our locks immediately changed, and then I had to take the next day off of school to drive to the nearest Nissan dealership, 30 minutes away, and then wait 7 hours for them to rewire a key fob for me. To the men who robbed me, let's not meet again, for your sake. Because I'm older and angry and have defensive weapons now, and won't be afraid to kick your ass. And to the cops who accused my roommate of robbing his own apartment, Let's not meet again, and I hope you got fired because yes, I did report you both. A stranger rang my doorbell at 3 a.m. This happened a few weeks ago. My front porch is right outside my bedroom wall. At night, I can hear everything that goes on out there. One night, I was woken out of a light sleep by my doorbell ringing at 3 a.m., let me tell you, I've never woken up so freaking fast in my entire life. My heart started racing as soon as my eyes flew open. I live alone and this has been one of the things I seriously hope would never happen. I just kept laying there, hoping they'd go away, but no. They rang the doorbell two more times. Trembling, I quietly got out of bed 
donned a robe and made my way into the living room. I didn't turn any lights on and I made sure I had my phone. I tried looking through the peephole in the door, but it was blocked by the wreath that was hanging on it outside, and there was no way in hell I was going to open the door. So I just shouted, Who's there? Hey, sorry to bother you, but I was wondering if I could get some water, they said. Turns out it was a man, and it sounded like he was young, late 20s, and also, WTF? Who goes around knocking on doors at 3 a.m. asking for water? I replied, do you have any idea what time it is? No, sorry, I don't have my phone. I'll leave you alone. Yeah, you need to leave or I'm calling the police. He said he was leaving, but I didn't hear or see him leave. I didn't see him walk past the living room window. Blinds were closed, but I was peeking out. So I figured he must have been walking through my yard instead. But I didn't hear his footsteps on the porch steps. And I didn't even hear the crunch of leaves as he walked on the yard. These are all things I can hear when someone leaves my house. This led me to think he was still on my porch, so I went ahead and called 911. Dispatch said they would stay on the line with me until an officer showed up. After about five minutes, I got the courage to go look through my bedroom window blinds, which would give me a good view of the porch. There was no one there, so I apologized to dispatch and said they didn't need to send anyone after all. A patrol car still rolled down my street with a big searchlight shining out on the houses, but that was the end of that. It was probably just some drunk idiot wandering around the neighborhood. He saw that my porch light was on and thought I might just help him. Just a theory though, there is no way I will ever open the door to a stranger and find out. You can bet that security cameras have been added to my list of things to buy. And I took that stupid wreath down the next morning. I was a kid, home alone, and a fake Girl Scout cookie salesman wouldn't leave. Years ago when I was 11... I was staying home alone with only my little brother who was seven. At that time, it was about 9 p.m., dark and pouring rain. And we were reading in our room right next to the front door with a big window and open blinds. That's when I hear the front doorbell ring, followed by knocking. I thought my parents had arrived. Strange, though, that they didn't use the garage or their keys. I looked outside to see their car. Nothing but rain. As I approached the door, I hear a man's voice that was not my father's yell through the torrent. Would you like some cookies? We're selling Girl Scout cookies. I'm shocked at this considering the weather and time of day. Saying nothing, I check the people and peer through the side window, only to see it was not a father with his girl as I expected. My heart dropped. Standing there was just a fully grown man, maybe in his late fifties. No box of cookies in sight. Soaking on my doorstep. I can remember the gut-wrenching feeling of having to check the locks while he was right on the other side. For sure he heard this. Two locks were the only thing separating myself and brother from a potential monster. He continued to knock and mention his cookies, as I considered calling the cops. That's when I remembered the blinds were open in my room where my brother was, with the light on. As I turn the corner into the doorway, I see the man carefully peering into our window, possibly eyeing my brother, distracted in his book. My heart was pounding now as I began to panic. In a move that took all of my willpower, I quickly turned off the lights and ran over to the window to close the blinds in full view of the man. As fast as I could, I double-checked all the locks in the house, closed the blinds, and told my brother to go hang out in one of the big closets in the interior of the house. No windows. I didn't tell him what was going on so he wouldn't be frightened, and for some reason I never did call the cops or my parents. I just waited in the hallway until he left. Still thinking about it gives me shivers that so many things could have gone wrong that night. My worst fear since is a stranger getting to the unlocked door before I do. 
The Watcher at Work I used to work in a cupcake van in the gardens of a castle in Yorkshire, England, during the summer months. We sold coffee, cakes, and other assorted refreshments, and it was an easy way to make a few extra pounds on the university holidays. Anyway, I was on my usual Saturday afternoon shift. The weather hadn't been particularly pleasant that day, so there weren't many customers. As lunchtime came, more people began to queue for coffees, and I was minding my own business serving them, when I could see a figure bobbing in and out of my eye line to the right. Between serving, I looked over and it was a tall, thin man with large, rimmed glasses and longish brown hair, cut into a bowl-cut style. He was staring at me with his nose scrunched up like he was straining his eyes to look at me so hard. I ignored it as best I could, and as he walked off, I brushed it off, as maybe someone who thought they had recognized me. Ten minutes came and went, and I had served a handful of customers who were now lounging in the foldaway chairs in front of the van. I turned around, cleaning down the milk frother, when I heard some rustling behind me. Thinking it was another customer waiting to be served, I turned around to meet the staring eyes of the man. Oh. Hi, uh, can I get you anything? I asked in my usual question. After all, he could genuinely have been a customer. He stood silent, just staring at me. I tried to keep my best customer service smile, but something about his eyes were so unsettling. An older guy and his son approached from behind the man, queuing to be served and I motioned for them to step forward. They seemed to notice the guy motionless, still staring at me, and asked if he was okay. He said nothing to either and simply stepped to one side to continue to watch me. I served the two guys their coffees and they sat down in front of the van mouthing to me, Are you okay? I nodded but they could clearly see I wasn't as they whispered to each other and their eyes never left the man. I sighed in relief as the man seemed to move away out of the eye line and I turned around to finish my cleaning. The caravan itself was built in the 1970s and was tiny. It had a small window on its door which only held with a small chunk of metal and was the flimsiest mechanism in the world. As I was cleaning, I saw a shadow at the door of the caravan. I knew instantly it was him. He was trying the door to the caravan which, thankfully, I always locked when I was alone working. Obviously finding it locked, I could see him through the tiny window surveying the back of the caravan looking for a way to get in. At this point, I was horrified. My heart was pounding and I had no idea what to do. Suddenly the man's face was at the window staring straight at me, before he looked around as much as he could and then disappearing out of view. The two men thankfully were still at the table, but unable to see what was happening behind the caravan and, as if by magic, the strange man appeared at my serving hatch again and this time he spoke. Where do you live? He asked, eyes staring again. Er, just the other side of the castle, I lied. Where exactly do you live? He asked again, eyes unblinking. I gave the name of a random street I'd lived on years previous which seemed to settle his curiosity before he asked me one final question. What time do you close? I never thought I would have been so quick with instinct before, but in that moment I knew the only thing I needed to do was lie as much as possible. So I told him we closed an hour later than we actually did knowing it would give me enough time to pack up and be gone if he chose to come back. My answer seemed to satisfy him for the time being and he walked away. A wave of relief spread over me and I couldn't help but start to cry as the two men rushed over and questioned me about what had happened. The older man stayed with me whilst I called my boss and asked her to come and help, and the younger man ran in the direction the strange man had gone but came back minutes later saying he had just vanished. The police were called and a new policy was made for people working alone there. We had to have walkie-talkie which was linked to the security of the castle, and if we pressed one button they would come running. Every day I am so thankful for those two men who stayed throughout the whole ordeal, making sure I was okay. But to the strange watcher at work, let's not meet.
Unhinged stalker demands to be my wife. This is the first time I've ever made a post on this subreddit, so apologies in advance if it's not in the proper format. I'm a longtime lurker and a first time writer. I am a 26 year old woman who has lived in Alaska my whole life. This will become important later when you see just how far this person would go to try to be with me. This all happened a few years back when I was in college. Like any woman at that age, I made a grave mistake of attempting online dating to disastrous consequences. I was using OkCupid to try and find a potential partner, but I also had it listed in my bio that I was looking for friends. One day, this girl, we'll call her Jen, messaged me. She seems nice, and we got to talking and really hit it off, but I made it clear that at the time I wasn't looking for a relationship due to being preoccupied with work and school. I should preface the rest of this story by saying that I like to help people, and it's really hard for me to not. Honestly, it's been the biggest flaw I've had over the years and was a contributing factor in multiple abusive relationships I've been in, before and since this incident. Anyway, the result of this has been that I tend to drain myself to try and help others, and it attracts unsavory and unstable people. We started going into conversations about our various interests, and eventually we stumbled across gaming as a mutual interest. Jen suggested we play this new game, Ark Survival Evolved. It's a cursed rune of a game that wasn't very well optimized for any system. To be honest, it was an absolute dumpster fire of a game, but at the time I thought it had a lot of potential, so I spent countless hours making various bases and trading dinosaurs, and getting into the whole bit of brave explorer of a new world kind of thing. Jen and I spent a lot of time in the multiplayer building things, and training dinos and talking and having a good time. During this time, she opened up to me about a lot of the abuse that she had suffered from past relationships and from a family that didn't accept her being gay. Having also been through some difficult times, I felt a lot of empathy for her and would try to build her up and talk her out of her self-hating talk when I had the energy to. This is when the trouble started, though. I had noticed that she was being a bit too friendly with me and kept being overtly sexual and flirty for a week or two. It started with in-game RP kind of stuff where you do the asterisk kisses and hugs thing and it was all just too much. She was really nice and all, but totally not my type. I had addressed the situation multiple times, saying that it had made me feel very uncomfortable, but every time we had that conversation, Jen would tell me that she understood and would back off and etc, etc. You know the drill. It never got through to her. By this time, we had started having communications on a chat app called Telegram. I wasn't always on my computer, so it seemed like a convenient solution. I started noticing that a lot of the emojis she was using displayed a very similar lack of respect for my boundaries. Just as before, I had mentioned to Jen that it made me feel uncomfortable. I knew she had a lot going on upstairs, but me being me, I have always been a very gentle soul. It's always been very difficult for me to set that firm boundary and to keep those especially around when someone is suffering. One weekend was very packed with homework and a double shift at work, so I ended up being home very late. I booted up the computer just to check some emails as I ate my dinner of Top Ramen before zonking out. When the stream loaded, I noticed that I had hundreds of missed messages and comments. All from Jen. I started from the top, and as I read through, things became progressively more and more out of control. By the time I was halfway through every other message, was either calling me names or threatening to kill herself if I didn't reply. I had seen enough, so I just sent a message saying that her behavior was unacceptable, but I can't be friends with someone who is going to be abusive like this. I blocked her on Steam and on Telegram. This is when shit really hit the fan. About 30 minutes later, my phone starts going off. Mind you, this is about 12.30am Alaska time, so that would make it about 3am for her. She called my cell number with what she had saved from Telegram. She was absolutely out of control. From the moment I picked up the phone, she was screaming obscenities and slurs at me, interspersed with confessions of love, 
and desperate pleas for me to unblock her so we could be friends again, and that she would just make it up to me and all that crap. I tried to explain to her that what she had done was out of line and that I just didn't have the emotional capacity to go through another abusive friendship, but she was having absolutely none of it. I did the only thing I could do. I ended the call and blocked the number. Five minutes later, I get a call from an unrecognized private number and pick up, knowing exactly what I was in for. It was her again, calling from her parents' landline. I immediately hung up. Fifteen seconds go by and my phone rings again. I dismiss the call. My phone rang again about five minutes later from the same number. This goes on for a solid 15 minutes before I turned my phone off and went to bed. It was a fairly sleepless night, but thankfully the next day I had class in the evening, so I had the opportunity to sleep in. I woke up from an okay sleep and turned my phone on to find over 100 missed calls and about as many voicemails. I checked my telegram to talk to a different friend about the chaos that was going on, to find new messages from six new accounts. Most of them were just walls of text filled with the same out-of-control ramblings that she had said on the phone. They were the texts of someone who had completely lost it. All over the place in tone and message, switching back and forth between I love you and insert slurs here, with little regard for spacing, punctuation, capitalization, or general legibility. I was horrified. I mean, I had seen my fair share of breakdowns, but... Never ones that impacted me directly. I was horrified. I mean, I had seen my fair share of breakdowns, but never ones that impacted me directly. Then I get a phone call. Same unknown private number. Hoping she had calmed down enough to listen to reason, I picked up and she started in sobbing and screaming unintelligibly at me. Starting right back in. Mad as hell, I screamed into the phone for her to shut up and for the first time in what probably was about 14 hours she did. Very clearly, I told her not to call me again and that she had gone way over the line and that I wanted nothing to do with her after this. In a calm monotone that still makes me shudder to this day, she said, What do I do to prove my love for you? Do you want me to kill myself? How about my dog? I can kill her for you. Honestly, I was so shocked I just told her no and that if she loved me, she would move on and get help. This was probably the worst possible answer. Immediately she started in again, screaming, so I just hung up and turned my phone off. Fuck, I'm shaking again just remembering this all. FML. She called me back constantly for the rest of the morning until I turned my phone off. The next day I went in and got my number changed, hoping that would be the end of it. A few days passed and I'm at work. My boss comes over saying I had a phone call from my mom. I thought nothing of it until I picked up the phone and heard Jen's voice on the other end. She started in talking about how she had been cutting herself and how she would keep going until she was dead if I didn't unblock her, so I hung up the phone without a word. I told my boss to not bother me with phone calls unless it was from a known listed number on my emergency contacts file. With my new phone, I set up Telegram again and started going through blocking all of her alt accounts, but that still wasn't the end of it. For about six months after this whole thing went down, every few weeks I would get a new Telegram contact on a new number begging me to unblock her so we could be together. I know it's not some big climactic end, but honestly, what could I do? All I knew of her at the time was her first name, screen name, and state. If I'd reported it to the police, nothing would have been done anyways. The cops here don't take kindly to queer people like myself, so I just didn't want to risk any BS with them. I have more tales of internet fuckery, but this is by far one of the most jarring that I encountered. Sorry if it's not all flared up, it's just the boring truth. Oh, and to the gin, the out-of-control lesbian from ARK Survival Evolved. I hope you've gotten help, but please, let's never meet again.